Welcome to AATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we'll be discussing a case of a young female who presented to us with complaints of palpitations. Can you begin, sir? <clears throat> so there was this one 27-year-old female who was a known case of cyclical Cushing's, but now presented with complaints of having neck pain that she had since about one month, and now palpitation since about two days, along with loose tools nausea and one one or two episodes of vomiting along with this she also has generalized tiredness and anxiety which we will be discussing later on but this this, this was her presenting complaint so yes, neck pain <coughs> alone or is there any complaint of swelling also no sir predominantly yes. just neck pain and uh, through the course of time she also developed this she had difficulty to even swallow dysphagia also no. came in but not as such a dynophagia as, was, as such wasn't there but difficulty to swallow was there <clears throat> so with this, in our initial 10 second assessment, patients, patient was conscious, oriented and obeying commands. So moving on to the airway part, primary survey, patient's airway was patent, no secretions, no hoarseness of voice was also noted, no anatomical deformity also seen. Moving on to the breathing part, she had a respiratory rate of 18 cycles per minute, maintaining saturation of 98% in room air. Bilateral air entry was equal with adequate chest excursions and no added sounds were heard. Now circulation wise, she was tachycardic um, and also um, b um, blood pressure was normal, 120 over, uh, actually it was lightly on a lower note, it was 100 over 60. Uh, uh, milli millimeter mercury and all peripheral pulses were palpable but she wasn't in shock like as in uh, her uh, it wasn't a cold shock but tachyarrhythmia was present tachycardia was present with regular rhythm so at this point in time disability wise her uh, gcs was full and uh, pupils were reactive no neurological deficits were noted exposure wise she was uh, uh, not afebrile but uh, um, body temperature was 98.9 degree Fahrenheit with GRBS of 105 milligram per deciliter. This was a primary survey. So as an adjunct, because this patient was tachycardic, uh, but obvious tachypnea was not, so she was anxious though, but um, no increased work of breathing was noted. So uh, ECG was taken. ECG showed sinus tachycardia, but the heart rate was about 154. Uh, uh, Beats How do you differentiate minute. SVT from sinus tachycardia? Sir, in SVT, basically uh, sinus rhythm, there will be a P that will be followed by a QRS complex, a narrow QRS complex with a P okay. and a normal PR interval. But in SVT, it is a impulse that is generated supra, uh, basically above the ventricles but not from the SA node. Okay. So, there will be absent P wave but uh, rate it, will uh, be regular. simply absent or uh, something it's else? Exactly overlapping all the QRS It is the thing. It is... Uh, it's there. Actually, it is there. It is it is along with the QRS only because both atrium and ventricle is uh, stimulated simultaneously. So, it the P wave is embedded inside the QRS complex. Sometimes, it, even you can see an inverted P wave after the QRS complex. But before QRS complex as a normal P wave, you are not able to see. Okay. But rhythm will be regular. Rhythm will be regular. Right. It will also be higher on SVT. Okay. So, More here it is 150. 50. Classically, uh, SVT the diagnosis is uh, above 140. 140. You can make it as SVT, but here P waves <coughs> are there. So, we have to think about sinus tachycardia. So, uh, then uh, moving on to the general examination, she was uh, uh, profuse sweating was present and minimal tremors were there. It wasn't too obvious, but if we ask her to stretch, her, stretch out her hand, we could see a little tremors. No pallorectus sinuses clubbing was noted. And then uh, systemic examination was pretty much within normal limits like we discussed earlier. Respiratory system, uh, in the circulation part, it was just that she was tachycardic but rhythm was regular like I mentioned earlier. And CNS, no deficits and so, uh, abdomen was also soft. So, uh, but since she was complaining of neck pain, we had a local examination of the neck wherein we could, the, the, uh, it appeared to us that the gland was little edematous and it was tender to touch okay. and little erythema was also present around the neck but it was extremely tender so we could not properly palpate for any nodules or as such because uh, uh, first of all she was tachycardic and the thing was too painful to her. Where do you get uh, painful thyroid gland enlargement? 
one would be thyroiditis so Thyroid, both infective uh, both infective and non infective thyroiditis you will have otherwise any which one will have more pain infective or non infective non infective no infective will have more pain because, because infective is because, acute uh, acute. acute that mm-hmm. is the most important thing non infective is normally it's a chronic process it takes time so there is a time for enlargement of the capsule but whereas in acute is sudden enlargement of gland and the gland will be st- sorry St-capsule. the cover in a capsule will be stretched that will produce more pain any other condition you can have painful thyroid node and thyroid enlargement Ma- m- toxic, toxic multi nodular coitus uh, toxic nodular coitus normally it is not painful but you are seeing lot of cases but if there is a bleeding into the nodule sudden enlargement of thyroid that itself can whatever may be the cause whether it is malignancy or multi nodular goiter if there is acute bleeding and acute enlargement of thyroid gland again it can produce painful thyroid enlargement so uh, then there was local rise of temperature was also present but there was no visible veins or skin discoloration that was noted no visible ulcers on the uh, uh, thyroid uh, on the neck and also no palpable cervical lymph nodes were noted in this patient so this was the local examination finding and because her thyroid gland appeared to be edematous we ruled out other signs like eye, no eye signs were oh. present to So this for is ER physician <coughs> which is more important what is more important than all these eye, eye signs they are they are all important in thyroiditis hyperthyroid for an ER physician somebody is having enlarged thyroid nodule what is more important the intubate first of all it with tachyarrhythmia sir okay. second because of enlarged thyroid so you can have same retrosternal goiter can be there so you have to di- you have a difficult intubation you have to anticipate correct ma'am yes sir so uh, retrosternal extension of the thyroid gland right? mm-hmm. so but um, b- whenever necessary you can take in x ray neck ap and lateral right. so that will give an idea about whether there is an extension in the retrosternal area or a tracheal deviation to one side or any cartilages or damage so that is very important you have to anticipate now patient is stable if the patient uh, needs intubation you should be ready for that mm-hmm. and about an hour later in patients reassessment wise uh, half an hour later about reassessment wise bp was now um, 110 70 but her temperature she was running a temperature of 103 degree fahrenheit okay so uh, moving on to the sample history she was known case of cyclical cushings and bilateral she had undergone bilateral adenectomy done in 2002 so ever since she was a small child she's been having a uh, she underwent the surgery and she has been on uh, hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone ever since she was 7 years of age okay um, so somebody is on replacement dose of hydrocortisone 10 mg bd okay she admitted to your icu with some illness we don't know whatever may be the illness what is the immediate step you do <coughs> most of the time it will be because of high steroid we give steroids uh, we make it iv iv steroids you increase the dose increase the okay dose. because you are going to have a situation where the stress there stress is there normally when we have stress hormones will release uh, an extra hormonal release will be there but here we are giving fixed dose so most of these patient who are on fixed dose of steroids when they admitted to your icu you have, you have to make sure that they they get an additional or extra dose or double the dose something like that we have to do otherwise this patient may develop hypotension shock only because they are not getting adequate steroid support in stressful condition okay should be very careful so stress dose of steroid has to be given additional dose has to be given or you can give iv uh, hydrocortisone additional 50 mg can be given so uh, since 21 years she has been on tablet hydrocortisone 5 mg uh, she takes 10 mg in the morning and 5 mg in the night so in a do- in a day her dose would be 15 mg of hydrocortisone she takes and fludrocortisone 100 microgram uh, she takes but it is basically 50 microgram half a tablet she takes in the morning so these what are is the basic tablets. difference between hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone fludrocortisone is a mineral or cortical what is the action of that mineral or cortical for that um, sodium so it, it, uh, maximum retention of water and sodium is by mineral or cortical hydrocortisone has got its uh, mineral or cortical action but whenever there is hypotension or hyponatremia we have to give we have to add uh, fludrocortisone with for many patient who is having steroid replacement therapy okay 
so she presented with complaints of pain over the neck that she's been having since about a month and uh, uh, previously in a past history five weeks ago she has had a uh, low grade fever history for about two to three days which spontaneously resolved just by taking paracetamol tablets and at that point in time she also had like one two days of rhinitis but it uh, uh, resolved on its own and then uh, from past two days prior to the admi- uh, arrival to the ER she developed dysphagia and because of that swelling over the neck but predominantly pain and uh, be- uh, because of the anxiety also she she developed dyspnea and uh, there's also one, one or two episodes of vomiting along with this she had had loose stools nausea and palpitations oh. and up the previous night she also developed profuse sweating which all the symptoms aggravated that day's morning which is why she presented to the er okay. uh, all secretions are increased all activities are activities are increased, increased. Okay. but there's no history of any visual disturbances blurring of vision diplopia that was in there and her lmp was that months uh, initial week so basically recent history of menstrual uh, cycle uh, her period but the, there's no past history of any irregular periods or drug intake or altered sensorium or behavior nothing of that sort was noted in this patient then uh, order thought intolerance heat intolerance uh, that history we haven't taken so okay and you have to examine the throat mm-hmm. is it difficulty or painful uh, de- uh, deglutination she is complaining mm-hmm. oral pathology any pharyngitis mm-hmm. or tonsillitis anything we have to rule out also that in addition checked, maybe uh-huh. okay. that was checked but she did, did not, not tell any, in there uh uh-uh, that was checked she did not have any okay, features okay. of uh, uh pharyngitis or tonsillitis uh-huh. for that uh-huh. matter no no um, um, signs of inflammation were were uh-huh. noted uh-huh. then uh, then moving on to the uh, at this point in, since it was a clinical diagnosis so we were thinking more on the lines of thyroiditis probably a viral thyroiditis because she's had a history of preceding history of a viral or a post viral uh, uh, consequence of that event and but she presented to us with in a state of hypothyroid state so possibly a thyrotoxicosis with that has aggravated no. her what symptoms what is the difference between hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis sir uh, when the symptoms go um, worsen then mm. and uh, thyroid toxicosis is nothing but thyroid storm which is becomes an emergency thyro- that is not thyroid storm uh, thyro toxicosis. thyroid toxicosis means all these toxic features Will be like tachycardia uh, sweating tremor, tremors sweating all are there then that is uh, thyro thyroid toxicosis when they are coming to emergency room with all this uh, aggravated problem like cardiac failure uh, supraventricular tachycardia atrial fibrillation then it will become a thyroid storm okay, okay. so uh, we were thinking more on lines of that so uh, our primary issue was to control her heart rate uh, possibly it, it had aggravated because of her temperature fever also so we gave paracetamol after uh, securing two large bore iv cannulas and keeping in mind a hypothyroid state we also gave her uh, beta blockers no. so a uh, tablet propranolol was added but along with this for an immediate care iv uh, metoprolol was given 2.5 mg since uh, even after 10 minutes of reassessment patient's heart rate did not decrease a little uh, significantly so we repeated another dose of okay. 2.5 so in total 5 mg was given then her temperature was brought into control what is the basic difference between propranolol and metoprolol propranolol is a non selective beta blocker so it will have systemic actions to mm-hmm. uh metoprolol is mostly cardio selective it causes the blood brain barrier <coughs> it is a main action okay the metoprolol does not cross, cross the blood brain barrier this one propranolol crosses the blood brain barrier mm-hmm. why it, why should it cross, i don't know what is the advantage of crossing blood brain barrier in hyperthyroidism so that also can have cns features starting from motor sensorium to seizures so here seizures tachycardia tremors all are due to partly due to cns problem partly due to the cardiac problem okay so the tremor will be there anxiety will be there and uh, sweating will be there these all things will be controlled on by propranolol but whereas the heart rate alone can be controlled by metoprolol. any of the drug but we don't have iv propranolol so we have to give metoprolol and continue the patient on propranolol propranolol so um 
beta blockers were given anti pyretics were given and then patient was kept on serial monitoring for bp uh, uh, bp basically it got corrected after fluid resuscitation one or two pints of bolus ns was given and then it stabilized to so 120 it is on the other over way, 70 normally when somebody come with a tachycardia hypotension we always we have to start the fluid first fluids okay yeah. fluid first then if the tachycardia does not come with that because uh, in, if it is due to hypotension alone that will come down okay then we have to give metoprolol or whatever it is okay so we should never try metoprolol or propranolol as a first line therapy when there is uh, hypotension you give fluids Fluid. then you can start uh, metoprolol or propranolol so for initially fluid resuscitation was done following which antipyretics was given and then the options of metoprolol was okay. also tried on and then the patient was put on oral propranolol 10 okay. mg was initiated on okay. uh, uh, then uh, be, uh, for thyroiditis the dosage will be from 20 to 120 mg okay. of propranolol can so be 40 given 40 mg tad can be started. started then it can increase up to 240 mg a higher dose are required in hyper- actual thyroidism this is not thyroidism does not reach towards the thyroidism thyroid she was having an impending thyroidism okay mm. so um then apa- so so the main line of treatment would be beta blockers mm. and uh, since by now we had established a diagnosis of subviral thyroiditis we had to confirm so mm. we sent for blood routine investigations which showed elevated inflammatory markers mm. along with this her tsh was very low it was 0.0 uh, it is suppressed sa- it was 0.005 mm. micro uh, uh, international unit per ml mm. and t4 was elevated to 7.77 nanogram per deciliter that is very high very high sir so thyroiditis was pretty much confirmed she was in hyperthyroid state so our next line of investigation was a, a, a radio no, technician that, scan see, ultrasound thyroid storm we will not be knowing whether it is a viral thyroiditis or a, a, like autoimmune thyroiditis or malignant induced thyroiditis patient has come with hyperthyroidism so we have to add one more drug uh, thyanomides Uh, uh, methimazol or propyl thyroiracil okay. if she is pregnant then it will be propyl thyroiracil okay. okay. even then propyl thyroiracil has got a better action in thyroid storm than carbamazol or uh, what do you say carbamazol methimazol okay so that, that has got a better action but even then we have started a different drug it's okay but how do you con- continue that drug is it uh, is it going to reduce the problem so uh, propyl thyroiracil has two actions mm. one it will cause peripheral conversion it will mm-hmm. inhibit peripheral okay. conversion of t4 to t3 and also along with uh, just like methimazole and carbamazole it also prevents uh, iodine uptake in thyroglobulins okay. Okay. that's how it acts on okay. so uh, uh, basically inhibits new production of thyroid, thyroid hormones, hormones. It, 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 it reduces the production it also uh, reduces the conversion, conversion. Okay. Okay. so here already produced, produced. Mm-hmm. okay and it is continuously producing because the thyroid gland is inflamed mm-hmm. okay so uh, what happens is in thi- viral thyroiditis whenever there is a viral antigen then apparently it's exact cause is not known but okay. what the the hypothesis is the viral antigen it Uh, combines with the HLA B35 complex, stirs up a inflammatory reaction which will destroy or damage the thyroid follicles. Okay. Then uh, thyroglobulin in the thyroid follicles that undergoes proteolysis and will be thrown out into the okay. circulation, okay. which is why there will be a phase of hyperthyroidism. Okay. Here actually there is no increased production; mm-hmm. it's only an, an exaggerated release from release the stores, stores and conversion to peripheral mm-hmm. conversion is occurring. So here carbamazol short term can be given, mm-hmm. not continuously like uh, your uh, Hashimoto's or uh, Graves. Ah, Graves. Sorry, a Graves disease. Graves disease. So uh this is how we stabilized the patient with antipyretics fluids beta blockers and uh, tepid sponging was also given on this patient to bring down the patient's uh temperature, temperature. then uh, ultrasound thyroid gland of and neck was also done which showed enlarged uh, uh thyroid with left lobule there was a left uh, there was a node in the left lobule of the no. thyroid gland and uh, uh, but fnsc at present we did not really go ahead with it because patient had painful thyroid and uh, but we went ahead with technician scan mm. 
Now, in technician scan, it showed uniformly decreased uptake, which favored a diagnosis of thyroiditis. If you're doing a technician scan, what are the pre typical presentation? If you take Graves' disease, <coughs> is the so, take is in increased or decreased? In Graves' disease, hashitoxicosis, all of these uptake will be increased. Generally increased. increased. All, increased. Almost all areas of the gland, it is going to increase. increase. Whereas in malignancies? Uh, it will be cold. Malignancy is hot, hot, hot spots. Hot spot. Most of the areas are cold, like most you told. Of most of the areas are cold. Only that malignancy area will be hot, 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 spots. Spots. hot spots. Whereas in viral thyroiditis, it will be uniformly it will decreased. Be uniformly reduced. Okay. So this is uniformly reduced. So it is mostly, uh, mostly viral thyroiditis. Okay. So uh, that was done, and Doppler was also done, but that only showed hyperemia, but no other uh, features were found out on. Uh, uh, Doppler study. Okay. So, with subacute thyroiditis, we continued the patient on. It is not office. subacute. That is a viral there is a difference. It's viral thyroiditis. Subacute is de Courvan's disease. Okay, okay, subacute is a chronic, like not like this. They don't present like this. They have mild symptoms, mild pain, with mild tachycardia. Okay, here it is a florid okay. presentation. All of uh, features are suddenly coming. Patient is having hyperthyroidism, going for a storm. Okay, they, this is called as acute thyroiditis. Okay. But uh, there are subacute means it is classically viral thyroiditis which presents slowly. Here it is thyroiditis, it can be due to virus, it can be due to bacteria, it can be due to tuberculosis, we don't know. Uh, so, ultrasound, technician scan, beta blockers, fluids, antiparatics. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, then we just carefully man uh, uh, monitored the patient serially and then all our infective parameters. The thing is steroids. Is, steroids uh, is the next option. Mm -hmm. Normally, most of the viral thyroiditis or th acute thyroiditis, which is not immune mediated, we can give anti inflammatory drugs and steroids. Okay. Here we have a patient who is having uh, steroid deficiencies. Eh? So we are justified in giving high dose of steroids even in this patient. Okay. We did continue this patient on a hydrocoid. 100 mg we gave initially as a BD dose. Then through the course of time, as in when she started to improve and inflammatory markers came down, 100 mg BD became 50 mg, we tapered it down to 50 mg BD. And then when all, all her symptoms, tachycardia, everything resolved is when we brought her back to her initial uh, dose. dosage of yeah, initial dosage of hydrocortisone. So uh, then there was another question whether should we initiate cholestyramine or not. Mm. Cholestyramine is, can be used as an adjunctive therapy. Mm. It is only... Where will you use it? it Cholestyramine is generally a bile acid sequestrant. Okay, that's correct. Here uh, in hyperthyroidism. In hyperthyroidism, whenever we use a thionamide as an adjunctive therapy, we can use okay, because it will increase If the patient is the not uptake. improving with your carbamisole, methimazole or propyl thyroxyl, then you can add this drug to the... Uh, Even the main okay. So, only that it is required. Otherwise, it is, it is not a very not good very drug. Common. So, it's just using an adjunctive therapy okay. to because it helps in the uptake of methimazole. Okay. So, um, yeah, steroids, beta blockers, mainstay of treatments. Mm -hmm. And then, what support are the adverse management. effects of uh, carbamisole, methimazole? Egg granulocytosis. Egg granulocytosis. So, we have to be very careful when we are using this type of drugs. Okay. They can develop sometimes a granulocytosis. Okay. LFT derangement can okay. be noted. So, as soon as possible, we have to withdraw these drugs because we know that now it is not. Graves disease. It's only an uh, infectious right. process. Mm -hmm. To just to control the symptoms, we have started it, and slowly we have to withdraw them and uh, stop it. Stop. Whereas in Graves disease, we'll be continuing 10 milligram TID, like that. We'll be continuing uh, for nearly two years. We have to continue. Okay. Uh, and if the patient is pregnant, then propyl thiouracil and uh, 100 mg TID dose okay. can be given. Okay. Uh, so, over the course of her stay in our hospital, patient improved, tachycardia settled, she became afebrile also, elevated markers decreased and then she was, she symptomatically, clinically also improved. Okay. She was hence discharged. Okay. So, as a ER physician, what all, what all your priorities? In hyperthyroidism or thyroid stone? Thyroid, thyroid, like a thyroid, is like a patient is coming, they can have multiple effects and multiple systems. Like a thermoregulator. Before going to anything, <coughs> airway, you have to <coughs> be very careful. Like Sir told, no, there is a difficulty in intubation for every patient who is having thyroid enlargement. That you have to anticipate. Okay. So, we will be going at like any other patient and we go to the and we go to the ABC. 
any like any possible area of friction or like difficult in the patient or we assess the patient and then we assess the patient for his like toxicosis symptoms like would either be a thermoregulatory issues like like uh, hypothermia and all that we have to manage with supportive medication initially <coughs> and the patient may have uh, cardiovascular effects we can uh, write from simple tachycardia to arrhythmia it cannot be from and also what type of cardiac failure they can have Uh, high output high, high output. output so cardiac. normally you don't see the cold peripheries mm-hmm. here you see the warm, warm peripheries or normal mm-hmm. peripheries uh, once it start affecting the cns the patient can start with like early little confusion it can worsen even up to seizures in the higher states and also the patient is affecting a ga system the patient can have nausea vomiting loose tools and all that so this multiple issues the patient can present with uh, so initial plan of management will be supportive care and we can start with fluid resuscitation and also the patient is having uh, hyperparesis we can go with uh, antibiotics and all that and once that is controlled we can go for like adrenergic blockers to control the cardiac effects like we can give start iv metoprolol and start with propranolol as uh, to control the adrenergic effects and the third step will be to control or reduce the production of uh, for the thyroid drugs or uh, for the thyroid hormones and also to uh, stop the peripheral conversion of thyroid for which we, the drug of choice will be like the let's say thyroid propyl thyronamide thyro- thyro- and once that step is also controlled the once the patient is stabilized and is not still in doing we can go for other agents like cortisol and all that and definitely to admit uh, one thing will be to like stop the uh, what triggered this incident could be an infection or something that may have triggered the acute event which we can uh, if we are able to identify we can manage that also and the final thing will be either surgery or radio ablation mm-hmm. surgery, surgery and radio ablation is in different it situation that is if there is a multinodular go- toxic multinodular virus surgery is going to help with a graves disease your radio uh, nucle- nu- radio nuclear ablation mm-hmm. will help okay. otherwise uh, they we don't do that in young female mm-hmm. patient so from ed first will be supportive care then beta adrenergic drugs to stop the adrenergic effects then to control the active release and conversion of thyroid and other supportive management nothing else okay this is drug selection for uh, rapid sequence intubation that would be patient would be in tachycardia so huh? so ketamine is ketamine causes tachycardia so that wouldn't be a ideal agent okay. for induction we will use atomidate uh, can be used and so atomidate the patient already having supplement steroids Stero- so steroid so steroid supplement but you give sir telling you know, mm. 100 mg hydrocortisone before starting any drug mm. better first thing you can give it empirically mm. then a propofol itself can be uh, propofol can be given and fentanyl fentanyl mm. can Analgesia be given analgesia part we have to take care mm. and then airway assessment as you are telling okay, mm. okay. thank you